let's let's start. So first of all, I'm John Costa, and I'm absolutely delighted here with my colleague Rob Watson at the uh, INCJ News Desk to the man behind the idea, really, the man behind the, the vision, um, the vision, the mission, the network. You know, if anything, um, John, you must be incredibly proud of today. This is the formalization of something that's been in your head for a while, I should imagine. Well, grateful that loads of people have said yes and that we've got this link happening uh, around the world and that uh, practitioners and some people who've got experience of being in the system, whether it be in prison or on supervision, uh, have been prepared to put time and energy into making it happen. So uh, it's a, a big thank you rather than pride, a bit of nervousness, I also have to say. Uh, but the, the idea was to let people talk about their work and talk about their experience and talk about whether it's made a difference in their lives. And we're at the halfway point. So now's a t chance maybe to ask whether people are getting anything out of it. And we'll also, we've got another four or five hours still to go. Uh, and we hope that people will find listening, not just live, but also on the podcasts and the YouTubes that we're going to record. So halfway there, I'm more relaxed than I was this time uh, four or five hours ago. Uh, so we'll see how it keeps on going. Yes, John? Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, well listen, you know, um, it, it's great to be able to talk to you because probably for the first time, there's maybe the, the people that are watching or maybe the people that are watching this back may have come across you or your name in the past and stuff like that. So let's this, just this bring everybody up to speed uh, with where we're at. I mean, because obviously the INCJ network has come from an idea that you've, you've given birth to and you've driven through. What was what was the idea behind it? What was the nucleus? Of, uh, can you remember a moment when you go, actually, we need a network now that brings criminal justice um, practitioners together? I think Brexit was probably the the the, the spur. And if you're British and you were worried about being uh, cut off from lots of the links that the European Union meant happened very naturally. Uh, it was important to many of us who were involved in building links uh, across the system to ensure that our commitment to learning from colleagues overseas kept on being there, and also to ensure that the learning didn't just happen because it was about money or about legislation, but learning happened because it was important to exchange uh, information academically, but also at a practice and policy level. And if that wasn't going to happen governmentally, it happened, had to happen another way. And all my working life, I've been interested in partnerships and I've been interested in talking and listening to people doing the actual job. And so an informal conversation-based network seemed the best way to go. And INCJ, uh, the International uh, Network for Criminal Justice, uh, formed because of that and has slowly been building up over the last couple of years. But it was the risks that colleagues were being exposed to because of Brexit that I think was the, the, the origin of the idea, John. So that, dis that disconnect between maybe structures that were already there for the sharing of knowledge and best practice. I mean, we've heard today from, you know, the guys in Finland talking about, you know, smart prisons and obviously uh, being smarter in how we use traditional prisons maybe is going to be one of those conversations post-COVID uh, post, uh, COVID is going to be even, even more uh, relevant. Do you think it's, it, it was as much about that to keep those connections, something that people could still be part of, still connected without it ne necessarily being sort of a... Um, through governmental level, at least people could still connect with each other that way? I mean, th there are statutory links. The Council of Europe obviously is very, very important and is still in existence. The political union might have changed for the United Kingdom, but there are legal treaty type, obli uh, type obligations that still exist. And then there are professional uh, organisations like Europris for prisons and the uh, Confederation of European Probation, and they are still uh, in existence. But what we were keen to ensure was that there were fast-moving, maybe fleet-footed ways of keeping in touch 
with developments. And I guess, and this is one of the themes of today, how uh, technology and social media mean that uh, quick exchanges uh, keep people in touch in a way that didn't happen 10, 15 years ago. So using uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, podcasts, YouTubes. In other words, using the sort of media that people 40 years younger than me just find so easy, so natural, mean that you can do things faster, quicker, and in a way more engaging than the flat-footed, uh, conference-led ways of getting together. And that's what INCJ is about. It's sort of, sort of a modern network, not one that tends to be hidebound. Now, uh, I'm of an age where I did a lot of work using the more formal methods of uh, engaging with other people and uh, other nationalities and other professions. But very often, the people that went to conferences abroad or did set speeches or had papers published, they tended to be, I'm going to use the phrase, big hitters. They were people sent by their governments or had uh, published or uh, were bosses. Uh, and actually, I think that it's exchange at practitioner and practice and the doing level was what was often missing. And the good thing about INCJ and the good thing about today is we've had people doing the actual job talking about what they were doing, whether it be in Holland or in uh, Finland or in Romania. And listening to people doing the actual job, I think, is a huge, huge value. And we wanted today to be about making a difference. And that's what we're all about. So um, although clearly INCJ is in relatively early days, what we're hoping is that by starting conversations like today's, we'll have a ripple effect and that we can build as much from the bottom up, uh, whereas in maybe 10, 20 years ago, it was much more from the top down. And that's the difference that we want to make. Yeah, there certainly seems to be an element of equity about it as well, where everybody values everybody else's input or wherever you are in the criminal justice system or whether you're you know pre you're inside or you're out you know what i mean whether you're studying whether you're aspirational for a career in criminal justice or someone at the end of their criminal justice career looking to give something back maybe to some people looking to get into it i think this is for me one of the uh, the interesting points when we were talking about in the early days of, 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 the, of the network but particularly the opportunity with something like the news desk today where it gets away from the traditional conference role as you said of some of the times the big hitters um you know are you able to afford to get there what we've got here is you know a resource now that's being live streamed and uh, so there's a, there's an equity equity there you know people are able to access it ask questions you know so it's not moderated to the point where you can't ask a question but also that it remains there for people to get involved and i would say that's one of the the big attractions really to this network it's not replacing anything that already exists or asking you not to join your existing professional network what it's doing is it's inviting you to come involved to become involved in something else that's in addition to the things that you might want to do from a career or a, a researcher point of view or a, an academic point of view and join something where there's different kind of conversations that can involve your practice or your research is am, am i kind of on, on the right track with that one yeah Adding Luckily, to, I've recorded that, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Adding to not taking away. Oh, I think you got that beautifully. Um, I think that if you think about uh, conversations, uh, conversations are always about what you say, but also what you listen to and listen and reflect. If all you're doing is talking, you're not you're not doing much listening. And that's very true of when you work with with people who've been in trouble with the law, isn't it? If, you, if all you do is lecture, well, then you're not having any chance to engage with somebody, find out where they're coming from, uh, really listening to the sort of experiences that the person has had, uh, whether you can uh, learn what's most likely to help them to change. And my... My own th thinking about what you, what you just said is that if we can add to what exists, 
that's really important. So we've had loads of support from Europris and CEP. As we've reached out to other universities, they're really interested in, uh, again, not the big bosses and the professors getting value out of this, but of people at the beginning of their careers. So um, particularly with the pandemic. So the news desk, for example, is you can't organize a, an international conference at the minute because no one's flying. But it's, it's really cheap just to do something that people can connect to on, a, on the internet or can listen to after the day's over. And we'll be recording lots of the sections of today and that people will listen to after work or when they've finished their lectures for the, for the day. And it's that sort of availability, which I think is, is, is really important. So adding to what exists, not taking away, starting conversations and seeing them through. That's what we're hoping to achieve. Yeah, that kind of that storytelling, isn't it? The sort of the reality of someone like Thomas, for example, who was talking earlier in in in, in Finland, you know, saying that his uh, Skype was an obvious thing for them to use uh, for for prisoners because they were five hundred kilometres from the nearest place if people were to come and visit. So you kind of you got people in lots of different scenarios in their particular uh, institution globally and is this really where the international element of the of the network really comes into its own that it's not just about prisons that are of a certain size prisons that are in a certain geographic locations prisons that are in a certain hemisphere it's more about what are people doing that's working and maybe working well that kind of positive positive role modeling whether that's you know best practice and sharing that in a way where people wouldn't normally be able to access it unless they were going to, to conferences yeah. Um, finding out what works is at the heart of this. So often people get caught up in their own jurisdiction, John. Uh, they uh, worry what uh, their local courts are going to think, what their local politicians are going to think. Whereas if you can find out what's really good in Holland um, and there's an evidence base behind it, it's really powerful to be able to say, well, we've found research that shows that this is really effective. Can we try this in our country? And uh, comparisons are really helpful, but also people speaking with confidence because it's been tried somewhere else really can help uh, encourage changed attitudes. Um, and particularly, I guess, as we emerge from the pandemic, uh, what seemed risky in a year's time will seem a lot less risky because it's been tried. And particularly, say, the idea of the smart prison, uh, that yes, there are risks with security, I think, in introducing technology, because there's a dark side to, to lots of things, as we know about hacking and those sorts of uh, risks. But I think bringing together the best of the ICT and the best of face-to-face -face is something that we should really try to do. So the isolation that a prisoner feels if they're 200 kilometers away from their loved ones can be much improved if they can have regular Zooms or Skypes with their, their partners or read bedside time stories to their kids. Uh, it make, it's made a real difference to you know to, to me being in touch with my uh, you know old old mum and dad or contact with my uh brother or grandchildren well so it would be exactly the same if you were uh, separated from your family if you were in prison so integrating and what we've learned through the pandemic which must learn from in the criminal justice system and not just go back to the way things used to be now that sort of learning if there are other jurisdictions that have done that learning better than you have in your own jurisdiction, hey, listen and learn from other people. Integrate best practice. And I think through conversations and through listening to other people, that's what INCJ should be all about. And the news desk today, by going to different countries and listening to people, uh, you know, putting on a show or talking about what they've been doing every day, can make a difference, I think. 
Now, one of the, the first things that we spoke about were um, when I first met you, uh, we threw Rob to talk about this news desk and, and the opportunity to do something was, I think I made a point about the role of the media and popular culture when it comes to the representation of prison. Uh, and we spoke about sort of, you know, the Shawshank Redemption version of prison and then the sort of the porridge uh, for, for those of you that are, are not British and, and know that 1970s TV sitcom, please go on YouTube and look up porridge, Norman Stanley Fletcher, um, through to maybe some of the more uh, kind of Danny Dyer, um, you know, Essex Boys things that we seem to have. And obviously Netflix now really buys into an Amazon, into the, the sort of the criminal side of things. Whenever you see prison represented it's either it's, it's invariably glorifies what it's like for the person that's gone in obviously that kind of badge of honor that kind of stuff through to um you know that their reaction to it and coming out and surviving it but no one ever really tells the story of people that are involved in that process and someone like yourself would maybe be able to within reason, accurately describe what some of your colleagues have spoke about this morning in their different countries, because, you know, there's a shared experience between probation officers around the world and prison officers and stuff. But particularly when it comes to members of the public, and certainly people that I've spoken to, for example, about, you know, you know what, what the experience was like, what, you know, what the regime's like, what does it actually mean when you do this, what is education, what is employment? There's a lot of misunderstanding, or most of it is just plain wrong how do you see the opportunity like this news desk and what the what the network can do when it comes to the sharing of stories of the people we spoke to this morning that are making positive inroads into people that are then going to change their life like some of that positive stuff that the romanian guys were talking about as a probation officer being able to be the person that even tells you that you're able to change or that there is a different route that you take oh <laughs> right there's a half hour answer and there's a two minute answer. So I'll try the two minute one. It's no accident that all around the world, they've used the word lockdown to describe what it's felt for us as human beings to try to stop this pandemic rushing all, you know, charging, cutting its way through society and to, to try to break uh, human relations and stop us mixing. And lockdown is comes from the prison service, doesn't it? Prisons where they, they lock you in your cell for 23 and a half hours a day or whatever it is. And lockdown is terrifying. You cut off, you lock behind the door, um, and it's lonely and frightening and... You know, it's a, it's a sort of form of mental torture. Now, we ha we've not experienced anything like that, even though we might be frightened by the disease. Lockdown that we've suffered is nothing compared to a lockdown in a prison. So even the language that we've used is an artifice, it seems to me, but it is only a small picture of what it is like to be deprived of your freedom. And I think, though, though we might as a society or as, as a humanity have had a taste of what imprisonment must be like, we can never, I think, um, really truly empathise with what, um, if you make mistakes, even, you know, really do dreadful things and end up in prison, uh, engage with what it's like to lose your freedom to be thrown into an uncertain environment, maybe uh, surrounded by people who you're frightened of. Uh, um, you might have mental health problems, substance abuse problems, you might be young, um, might be disorientated. Now, uh, what I'm trying to communicate is that uh, if you're working in that system, Empathy and intellectual frameworks for understanding those um, upheavals in a human being's life are really, really important. And uh, I think that some of the skills that we've heard talked about, say, for example, in Barcelona of engaging with sex offenders who are often the most rejected 
of offenders, the most feared and the most despised, and thinking about how a circle of community members try to support sex offenders to re-enter society, but then there's an outer circle of professionals also working with them, was inspirational. And it seems to me that the community has to own responsibility for crime and not just try to put any type of offender in a dustbin, put a lid on the dustbin and say, it doesn't affect us. So the challenge to societies all around the world is, um, how does community take some responsibility to put right some of the causes of crime, as well as to challenge the uh, behaviours of individuals that have committed crime. And it's, uh, it's, it's a tough shout. It's a tough call. Yeah, I mean, that's a societal conversation that involves things like, you know, politics, isn't it? Sort of, you know, politics are, are around sort of, you know, the cr criminal behaviour, going to be tough on criminals and, you know, tough on crime and all that kind of stuff. It, it gets very kind of, uh, politically charged and therefore it's very difficult to have a conversation um, and may maybe maybe the INCJ becomes that safe space for these kind of conversations to to take place where people can challenge some of those norms um, some of those things I've got sorry you, you're going to respond so I'll let you go well I think it's if, if all you do is want to blame individuals you're missing the fact that there's you know a community and a society that's part of the equation and uh, it's complicated, as <laughs> as relationships often are. Whether you whether you watch things on television or you live in a real family, it's often complicated, and uh, there are there are often no simple solutions. And I think that through uh, discussions like we've been having today in different countries, applying skill and getting alongside offenders whether it be in a prison setting or in a community setting, working as skillfully as you can to help people change is probably a great deal more positive and has much more effective outcomes than throwing them in a prison and throwing the key away. Now, one of the interesting aspects of, of the network um, with the website and, um, and the role that uh, Rob Watson's been playing in sort of bringing all the and coordinating things together and presenting it all is obviously the, the the regular recording now of things like vlogs and uh, and podcasts and, and you've been involved in in quite a few of them. You know what, what what's the value as someone who spends your you know and has spent your entire career talking to people and having some of these conversations maybe for the first time actually having them recorded in a way that it's actually quite relaxed and informal and informational in sharing information as opposed to factual and being driven to you know get budgets or whatever with your role in the home office H have you found the whole opportunity to be involved in those podcasts quite um enlightening and quite different from some of the things you've done in the past yeah john i must have written millions of words which have just gone in you know documents to ministers or papers to committees uh and i guess if you you could probably find quite a few of them on the internet but in terms of conversations, most of those just evaporate, don't they? So what we thought we'd do on INCJ was make a series uh, of podcasts and see if by recording them, they would be of interest. And we've done two series, one uh, about leadership within the criminal justice system through the pandemic, and another about how practitioners have been affected by the pandemic. And next year, we'll do a different series uh, because we don't want to be just dominated by uh, the, the pandemic. And so what, one of the things we thought was we'd use today and the themes coming out of today to identify what the topic would be next year. So we want to, be, we want to interact with what's come out of the uh, material that uh, offenders and uh, practitioners have identified today. But it's been really interesting, maybe over half an hour or 35 minutes, in a one-to-one a -one or two people talking to, to me, to see how their conversation can bring light or some depth to, to a topic. And 
I, I, perhaps if I could just use two illustrations, John, if, if that's okay, quickly, to to highlight um, something that went to places that was unexpected to me. Uh, one of them was uh, the only time I've ever interviewed a professional broadcaster. So this was Phil Maguire. So if you're out there, Phil, thanks for this. Phil Maguire used to work for the BBC uh, here in uh, in the UK, and uh, he was on uh, BBC Radio Two. And he answered an advert to help set up uh, prison radio uh, as a sort of a short six-month secondment. And he did that for six months. And he thought, I love this. I'm going to make this my life's work. And we we did an interview with him on INCJ. And it's a fascinating story about how he, he tells a story about radio, but also what a shock it was not to be able to go inside prisons because of COVID and how they had to change how they made the radio programs and everything. Absolutely fascinating about what he's learned as a non-professional about how to engage with people who were you know, basically trapped inside a prison cell and the, how frightened they were for their families on the outside. And it was just great getting him to talk about that. And of course he's, fluent, articulate, and very challenging about the language that people use when they discuss crime. You know, just just amazing. And of course, because he was a professional, it was a joy just to, to start him off and off he would you know, talk away. But another interview, which also was a real surprise, was when we were talking with uh, a woman called Claudia Musicato. Uh, and she's a, a law professor from Milano. Now that sounds pretty dry, doesn't it? But I've never met such a relational orientated l- lawyer in my life. And she's a restorative justice practitioner. Now, Claudia um, works long term with the victims of armed gangs. Now, to you and me, that's mafia and terrorists so this is at the real extreme end and it was really powerful the illustration she was able to use of how you know victim of you know terrorist atrocity uh, was able to accept a lift from someone who'd been released and drive many hundreds of kilometers to a meeting two of them in a car just talking now, if that isn't about restoration, if some forgiveness, very, very powerful. And how but it's interesting, it wasn't just about mediation that this was powerful, but how she was in Milan caught up in the pandemic, which was the sort of the epicenter, wasn't it, of the first wave. And her father died just as lockdown happened in Milano. And I guess that was must have been a really, really sad time. He didn't die of COVID. But how she realised that all the victims of COVID were sort of um, setting up associations to start legal proceedings, criminal legal proceedings against the authorities. And she's saying this is not the right way to handle it. Now, all around the world, there'll be people angry about COVID and the failure of the authorities to maybe some of it criminal, you know, making money out of it or um, negligence. But she's saying restorative justice processes are the way to handle this, not criminal. Now, INCJ allowed us to have an insight, and I would recommend both of those two podcasts, which I think have real significance beyond just a a fireside chat. So I think from the world of justice, from practitioners, you know, superb things uh, can happen and can keep on happening, even though the pandemic has got in the way. I think they're two interesting examples that you give there, isn't it? Because I remember, uh, I was thinking what what you were saying about um, uh, Mr. Maguire there. And I remember when 
the, the famous Sun headline uh, I remember seeing when prison radio was going to be beamed into, they were saying about being beamed in through to you know, prison cells. These like, lazy lags, blah, 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 sort of, you know, sitting around all day doing nothing, probably reading the Sun, listening to the radio. Well, of course, this was an opportunity to people that were kind of, you know, captive, in inverted commas, a captive audience to actually start giving them positive messages, either not just about, you know, um, victim awareness, restorative justice, but also about you know self respect and self esteem for them and their own their own positive view of themselves probably, and different ways. And so there's that. And then you were saying there about that uh, you know the, the Italian example. I guess my, my 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 the point I was going to make here is in the UK for our international uh, viewers and listeners is we've got this kind of build back better. A concept of you know what we're going to do next and sort of go back to you know how do we move forward? I guess you know something like that restorative justice, even that that thinking where it comes to being able to understand the person, uh, you know maybe meet for the first t- time the person not only from a, from a restorative justice point of view but people that you don't like from another country, refugees and asylum seekers, you know gypsies and travellers, and um, there's a lot to be had there isn't it about the value of these kind of conversations and capturing them i think that's a really profound thing to say that we uh, want to put people in little boxes because it's easier but it might not be the truth and um i think that if you can listen and respect people who are different to you that's a really important way of living together uh, in a better way. Um, Certainly building back better uh, is something that uh, INCJ would like to do. Um, We uh, are building a network of nine universities, John, and we would like to do international criminal justice development work better. And one of the things we would like to do is not just do projects, but to build research into projects better. So that as you, if you're doing a new piece of work, well, really evaluate it properly. Don't, don't just have an idea. Make sure it's a good idea. Make sure that you test it out properly. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an example from when I was a very young probation officer. Someone had a great idea uh, in a town where I was working with in Reading, and they said, oh, it's a really good idea to teach um, young kids who nick cars uh, how to do um, uh, to car repairs, let them work on old motors, and let's take them uh, uh, rally car racing and, and in jalopies, and it'll keep them out of trouble. And the, the whole load of money was spent on teaching them mechanic skills and things. And actually, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't keep them out of trouble. Um, and so what you've got to do is make sure that you address the reasons that kids get in trouble. And um, it, it didn't actually stop any other any kids going out and nicking cars. It circles back to your societal point earlier, wasn't it? Which is um, we're not thinking about what's got them to the point where they present themselves to the criminal justice system. We always think about they're in the criminal justice system. Let's deal with what we've got in front of us. Well, it's, it's about, uh, you know, the, the, what works is, is a really important question. But um, Jan Donescu, who appeared earlier from Romania, has another question. It's about who works. So what are the skills that are needed? And who are the right sort of people? And I've been really fascinated today to ask questions about, well, people who've been in trouble themselves, uh, who've got through, who've moved on, they're often really good to work alongside uh, probation officers or prison officers because they can be good role models. uh, And we're often very suspicious about motivation of, of people who've been in the system. But who works is a really good question as well as what works. And I think that we should ask both questions, not just the first. So final question from myself. Um, Let's look forward, look forward positively, you know, the future. Um, How would you like the INCJ um, to to develop? And I don't necessarily mean in 
growth in size or you know reach or anything like that you know so give, give me something that's not the traditional answer you'd give me in, in an elevator for 30 seconds and i said i want to give you five million pounds my budget john would you like it you know I mean, tell me what you're going to do with it you know just answer that kind of question you, you know john i haven't a clue how to develop because when uh when we first uh, at the Montfort University, which we're ever so grateful, sponsors this work. Uh, we first started thinking about this was uh, in 2019, when nobody had a clue what was coming over the horizon. And so the pandemic uh, put an end to any thinking that we originally had. So actually, that's really exciting because what's happened has blown our minds. And uh, the fact that we've been able to make connections uh, and do different things because of the pandemic has, I think, been very exciting. So my answer is, you know how people say, oh, that, uh, things are not going to be the same when uh, the pandemic uh and it is over. Now that might be one year, two years before in a, a world terms, the pandemic's over. And there might not be a new normal, there might be a new difference. But one of the things that people might not have noticed, but for example, there was someone from Argentina who I don't know was um, in the chat room this morning. Now that's a connection that would not have happened if we weren't running this event today. And I think that we need to find ways of building uh, bridges or links that can uh, grow uh, an exchange of ideas, which goes beyond, I'm going to use the word chats, that can become substantive and build connections, which are bridges that people can walk across. So. One of my, I mentioned earlier that we have, um, through INCJ, got a group of nine universities from Australia through to the States and you know, several stopping off points in, in, in the middle. Well, we're, we're, we're wanting to build a partnership. And from that partnership, I think there will be substantive opportunities to do work that will have lasting value. But although that sounds like building foundations and sort of uh, solid things, that none of that would, ha would happen or have value unless there were the informal links between scholars and practitioners and policymakers. So INCJ, I think, will always be about the conversation, and conversation will only be any good if there's someone who's talking and talking common sense and someone who's listening and reflecting and then talking back again. And actually the dyad is the thing that really matters. So what we will be doing um, both this year and next is running seminars where we hope we'll have lively discussions that people will take part in. We'll be doing podcasts that we hope people will listen to. But above all, we hope that you know our, our listeners will say, hey, I'd like to do something. And they would put in an idea and they'll be really pleased to have ideas from outside not least from today. Brilliant. Well, anyone who's watching this uh, live or, or watching it back uh, afterwards or maybe finding it on the website will see that we've had lots of different countries this morning and we've got more countries to come, but also there were quite a lot of countries that couldn't engage with us um, due to time uh, pressures, um, getting permissions and stuff like that, because again, some restrictions, it's not as easy for them to talk to us as it might be to get permissions from various uh, bosses. And again, the fact that we've even got anybody talking to us, I think, in the middle of a global pandemic is, is testament to the commitment uh, to the people that are, that are speaking to us and, and those that want to get involved in the next one, but also to uh, the respect that they've got for you, John, with the idea that you've had and your colleagues, um, the ones you've been working with at uh, De Montfort University and certainly to Rob as well, to be able to build something that is, is of value to join. I think that's the other the other thing that if someone's going to put some time into it, they feel as if the, the, um, the respect is reciprocated but also the time but also what is said is valued so i think that that's fantastic so well done it's wonderful to talk to you and thank you for taking the time to speak to us yeah well i'm 
I'm, uh, I can now relax and I can enjoy the rest of the day now. <laughs> Thanks for a lot, John. Thank you, John, too. Bye. Bye.